Hi, I'm Ethan Wong, and today I'm here speaking with Nick Montfort. Uh, we'll just get straight into the questions. Um, first of all, uh, I'll ask this because it's something that I ask everyone who comes on here. But mm -hmm. um, why poetry? As in, what is special about poetry? What kind of draws you to poetry over other mediums, even if you do pursue other mediums as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one reason that um, the work I do falls under the rubric of poetry um, is that it's a very expansive category. If you're doing work with language that is not easily classified or classifiable, then uh, poetry will take it in, in many cases. Um, but it's also because the work of poets to inquire about language, explore language, find out how words fit together in less conventional or prosaic ways is something that resonates with me and is part of what I do. Um, I'm not as interested in simply producing a good yarn. I'm um, interested in issues of conceptual metaphor and how they manifest them in metaphorical expression, um, in other types of figuration, musicality, um, in different qualities of language that um, are explored in the uh, in the framework of poetry um, more than they are in um, in other types of writing, and where the focus is that type of uh, engagement with language. Yeah, I definitely agree with your point that um, poetry tends to be a lot more accepting and broad in its categorization of itself than a lot of other forms of writing, which is why it feels like such a broad field in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to kind of ask on that same line. So I know you're into computational poetry. Uh, what kind of was your experience writing poetry traditionally, whatever that means, like non-computationally, sure, I guess sure. is a better way to put it. Yeah, well, computation. So what computational poetry is, is perhaps something we should talk about a little bit. Um, uh, so generally, I think that there are ways that computing can be used creatively. Um, there are poetic engagements, which are linguistic engagements um, that we understand as poetry. And in the intersection of these things, we find computational work that is also engaged with language in poetic ways. Um, whether it's poetry to which computation has been added, computation to which poetry has been added, or whether neither of those is a very good way to think about it, uh, that's an open question. Um, but um, it is something that uses number, order, algorithm, counting, uh, various methods that we're becoming more and more familiar with through the ubiquity of computing in combination with language and the literary engagements that poets bring to language. So I'm interested actually not only in other types of poetry that aren't computational, but also other types of creative computing that aren't uh, related to language specifically. So I'm interested in, um, on the computing side, work that generative artists do, and it looks like things in the visual arts, work that people in the demo scene do, which is engaged with the specifics of different computer platforms and trying to make real-time effects. Um, and, uh, of course, I'm, I'm very interested in many other types of poetry as well. For me, there's a particular excitement in how computation can be brought together with 
that poetic engagement with language. And I think it's also where I can contribute. Uh, it's what interests me and it's probably what I can do that's most interesting to other people. Yeah. So that's, you know, one of the reasons that that intersection is particularly fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess my question would be, have you, before you started in computational poetry, did you ever pursue like non-computational poetry? And what was that transition mm -hmm. kind of like? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that I transitioned away from writing uh, plain old poems. Um, I. I did uh, write. I did write poetry, and I still write poetry that uh, is putting words in a row. Um, I uh, I write uh, constrained poems where one thinks about language in um, a way that might be more mathematical than is typical, and is less associated with particular um, standard poetic traditions. Um, so instead of accentual syllabic meter, um, you, know, you might adopt a constraint such that uh, I won't use any letters that have ascenders or descenders on them. I typographically constrain myself to only write words um, using uh, this limited um, range of letters, or um, I'll only use three letter words. Um, or I'll only use words of one syllable. Um, so that's uh, one of the ways um, to be involved with language as a poet that has some antecedent in groups like the Ulipo, a French um, group of uh, writers and mathematicians. Um, but uh, we wouldn't exactly call it traditional. That's associated with this 20, 20th century avant-garde. And so some of those practices extending into the 21st century are things that are connected to poetic traditions in certain ways and establishing new types of practices and methods in other ways. Um, and uh, those are things that have been my interests. But uh, when I was you know, first writing poems, um, not being compelled to do so in an elementary school classroom, but choosing to write on my own and selecting my own readings uh, and um, uh, you know, determining things that interested me as a reader and writer, I was learning to program in the basic programming language at the same time. So I was involved with computing at the same time that I was uh, first starting to develop as a writer. So this, it wasn't something that, uh, for some people, um, whether they're in music or visual art or poetry, some people will say um, they know the moment when they discover the computer and everything they had done up to that point, they realize, oh, it has to change. I'm now going to become a you know, computer artist or a computer poet. Um, but there really was no moment like that for me. Um, I was always engaged with computing and its cultural and conceptual and expressive potential, uh, while I was also fascinated with other aspects of writing and poetry and literature. Yeah, that's really interesting, um, especially because that totally makes sense that you wouldn't just stop writing like normal poetry, uh, even after you started computational poetry, because mm -hmm. it's not, it, they're not, I guess in that sense, really direct substitutes for each other. It's more that you're trying to create something additive with the way you use computation in your poetry, um, like another element, right? And um, I also wanted to ask then, since I feel that, um, or I shouldn't say that, but uh, there might be an element to which I perceive that computational poetry can be a bit more uh, platform-based in the sense that like, it is, it centers around the tool, specific tool that you're using to create the uh, poem. Uh, mm -hmm. In that sense, is the source of inspiration like slightly different from the source of inspiration for a non-computational poem? Like, do you find yourself being inspired to do computational poetry just because of a discovery within the platform itself? 
Um, I do because my practice is engaged with the particularities of computer platforms, something that I study in my work as a scholar of digital media, as a researcher, um, that I also try to exploit and work with and be sensitive to as an artist. Um, but uh, that's also not specific to people working with computation. So uh, there's, a, you know, for instance, um, uh, work of um, artist book makers. Uh, Johanna Drucker has a book uh, A through Z where she took every piece of type, foundry type from the printing press just down the street, um, Harvard's Bow and Arrow Press, and she used every piece of type that was uh, there at that press to make her book. Right? So that's a very particular constraint that is a material constraint and having to do with the printing technology. And so we can choose to do that um, even if we don't have a printing press, right? We can also choose that, for instance, we want to write uh, an abedisery. We want to write something that has, you know, uh, a line or a word for every letter of the alphabet. Um, we can constrain ourselves to these other platforms that exist, to these language platforms. Um, as well as printing technologies, as well as computing technologies. Um, so I do work with those, um, but uh, I'm interested in um, having a serious sort of engagement and relationship with, for instance, um, well, one particular uh, computing standard that I think is very fascinating is Unicode, uh, the character encoding set that is meant to encapsulate um, and represent all of co contemporary writing, every particular contemporary writing system, as well as some historical ones, um, as well as, of course, emoji. That's what we know most about. Uh, that's what's in the news, right, related to um, uh, Unicode. Uh, there's also block drawing characters. There's other things. It's a typographical system that expands to uh, have all of these other different sorts of representations and possibilities within it. Uh, of course, it's easier to access some of these representations than others, even on cutting edge computing systems. Um, the beginning of those Unicode characters are the classic ASCII characters that are the Latin alphabet, what we use in English. Um, and though that's still the most widespread sort of character encoding um, that people can get to. Um, so trying to do work that exposes what Unicode actually um, is as a standard, right? It's in, and it, it's this quirky type of, in a certain way, very utopian project. It's a very hopeful project. We want to, everyone's computers, everyone's phones, everywhere in the world, we want them to uh, have universal representation of all the writing that goes on in the world, right? It's a very ambitious and uh, uh, amazing sort of idea. It's at the same time, it's a huge bureaucracy. It's a consortium run by companies uh, with their own commercial interests. Um, uh, there are complexities and quirks to accessing this technically. Um, so, you know, for me, that's an issue um, that poetry can address. And that, I mean, this, this has to do with my perspective on from my standpoint and from my practice as a poet, you know, what poetry is to me um, and what I'm trying to do as a poet. So I, I'm not working whether I write a traditional sort of poem uh, or a computational poem. Um, my main goal is not self-expression. Uh, I'm not trying to be confessional, therapeutic. Uh, I'm not trying to work through issues. I'm really trying to explore language. Um, and for the most part, with, with few exceptions, um, I'm looking to see what the uh, unusual boundaries and outliers of language are and how poetry, 
can help me and those who encounter my work grapple with that. Uh, so because of this, I think computation is well suited to that type of purpose. People also use computation to do expressive and imaginative types of work. But for me, as an explorer of language, uh, computing allows me to project what poetry can do in new ways. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, kind of following off of that, I wanted to ask, and I'm not sure if this is uh, exactly the way I'd phrase it, but when mm -hmm. you have been like doing this computational poetry, do you think you've learned more about poetry or do you think you've learned more mm -hmm. poetry and language or do you think you've more learned more about computation itself? Yeah, so that's a reasonable question. Um, and um, I think it's, uh, it, well, first of all, I, I don't know everything that I've learned when I finish a project. I often only realize it years later for various reasons. Um, sometimes because other people take up the work that I've done, they study it, they reflect on it, Sometimes they modify it and make it the basis of their own work. Sometimes I sleep on it for a few years and uh, think about something else myself, right? Um, and things come into play related to other people's practice of poetry and other poetic works, as well as computational art. Uh, so we're talking about computational poetry as if it were a species of poetry, but one could also say there's such a thing as computational art, because a lot of the people I'm in touch with are visual artists or identify as visual artists or conceptual artists or uh, musicians, uh, they're people in performance. Um, and uh, people work with computation in ways that are relevant to what I do, um, although what they're doing is on the um, on the computational side, if you will, or in the framework of the computational arts. Right. So um, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, not really with the inherent nature of the work, like oh, this work. Is, is so great, it provides this insight into poetry. You know, this work is, so, is provides this insight into computation. Um, but it, it's really, you know, for me, um, what I want to use it to think against and with, how I want to compare it to other projects that I know about. And so I, I would say that, you know, my own practice, my own work, I feel would be very stunted if I, only circulated among poets, um, or if I only circul circulated among people who were uh, working with computation. Yeah. Uh, and one last question before we get on to the poem, which mm -hmm. is um, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to get into computational poetry, whether that's because they mm -hmm. are a poet and they want to get into the computation side or uh, they do more computation, but they want to get into the poetic side. Yeah, um, well, or, or hopefully uh, there's, there's people who you know, maybe will discover uh, things about uh, both poetry and computation, right? Um, uh, I think the most succinct advice I could give is um, to, um, to certainly look at the work that's there, um, but to engage in the practice of making this work. And one of the, one of the things, you know, we notice sometimes that there's, there's, there's write only poets as we might call them within the, uh, in a sort of computational framework where uh, they don't read other poetry, they just write their own poems, right? Um, so um, if you wanna actually be involved with, uh, computational poetry, you can look at existing work, uh, 
you can study that work, you can modify that work, and you can begin to learn how to program something that is your project, something that's inquiring and exploring in the way you want to, or expressing and uh, engaging with your experience in the way you want to, um, by using some other work as a starting point. So my website, nickm.com, has several classic text generators. Um, I have a section of that that's called um, Memory Slam. It sounds like a somewhat violent uh, name, but there was a poetry, there was a, there was a a code poetry slam that was hosted at NYU and they asked me to come and judge that. And so um, I quickly put together some, some programs that were classic poetry generators um, in modern day implementations. And you can simply download the web page, just do save as, put it on your desktop and start messing with it, start modifying it. Um, and so these works like Allison Knowles and James Tinney's House of Dust, Taylor Lutz's Stochastic Text, you know, uh, they're there for you to um, not just enjoy, not just study and see how they work, but actually modify and develop into something of your own. Um, and people are welcome to do that with my work also. Um, I've specifically devised it in almost all cases to where it's easy to study, it's easy, to, it's online, it's easy to share, there's nothing obfuscated about it, uh, but it's also possible for um, people to wade in and start replacing my words with their words, and see what happens, change a number here and there, does the progression of text speed up or slow down or what happens? Um, and so all of these things are uh, possible um, and this is the way, not in the sense of poetry, but in the sense of people's early engagement with the web, you know, being able to view source and look at what was going on on a web page, that's how a lot of people started learning about computing you know, in the 90s um, and the things that could be put onto the web and the way that you would not write computer programs initially because early on, JavaScript wasn't uh, as widespread, but um, the way that you would present text in a certain organization and layout. Um, so, um, so I would say you have the special opportunity with computational work to not only look at and appreciate the work and sort of sit back and lean back and, and read something or interact with something, but actually modify it to understand that through the process of modifying code, working with a program. Um, and you can extend that even to making a project of your own that way. So um, I also publish a magazine for very short computational poems called Taper, which is at taper.badcore.to bad quarto is my uh, very small idiosyncratic uh, press that I have. And thanks to an editorial collective, um, this magazine also offers free Libra open source computational poems that people can take, study, share, modify, even build their own work out of. So that from my standpoint is the ideal way to get started. Yeah. And that is really interesting because um, that is just a totally different realm of possibilities than, and you're right, it is um, really, sounds really invaluable to be able to just sort of pick up a piece of work that you already appreciate and kind of build off of it and learn that way, as opposed to, and it's in ways very similar to the way that um, even when I write normal poetry or when people write normal poetry and they're first getting into it, their first poems can be imitations of poems that they like. I think it's very similar, except that um, here, it feels like you get a lot more direct and really more involved in the way you can, uh, you get that opportunity to be, to be so uh, when you work with that piece. 
Yeah, you can do it from the standpoint of trying to study it and understand it, uh, but uh, you can also just carve your name in the dashboard, and, you know, make this into something of your own um, and use it uh, as the basis for a project or use it as a learning experience. And then having figured out how to code, you know, write something completely different, but uh, drawing on what you learned. Yeah. Uh, and if you're ready, we can get into the poem. Sure. Um, I'm actually going to read some from what may sound like a very conventional type of text, or at least more conventional than some of the other things that my computational poems output. So this is a poem called Taroko Gorge, and I wrote it um, back in January 2009. And um, I was um, in Taiwan at Taroko Gorge, which is uh, sort of uh, Taiwan's um, Grand Canyon. And I thought, well, there's a, of course, this sort of cliche of the, you know, Western white guy going off to the East and writing about natural beauty. Um, I thought, okay, well, if, if, we can have a traditional poem sort of written like that. Why not a poetry generator? Why not a computational poem that does something similar? Um, and so I put together a one page uh, Python program initially. And a little while later, I uh, ported this program to JavaScript. I made a web version that does the same thing. It, produces the same sort of output. It works in the same way, but it's on the web. Um, so I'm gonna read some of its output, but I, I'll tell you why this is interesting, first of all, because from my standpoint, it's not interesting at all. Uh, like I say, this is actually one of the more sort of conservative things that I've written. Um, and what made this into an interesting project was that other people, did exactly what we were talking about. They took Taroko Gorge and some of uh, the people who did this didn't have much or any previous programming experience, but they substituted their own words. They started messing with the web page, including the code, and they made their own projects, often using the same form that I had originally defined, but uh, in radically different ways. So uh, creating a parody of this work. So Taroko Gorge, this, this piece that's originally um, is genuinely, it, I mean, it's, my work isn't a parody of anything. It's, it's actually about my uh, being, you know, in this national park and observing um, uh, these things that are represented in the poem. Um, but um, Scott Retberg uh, took this and uh, created a piece called Tokyo Garage. Um, and his piece is about a feverish uh, sort of Western fantasy of what it would be like to be in an urban environment of Tokyo, which he has never been in, he, or he, he hadn't when he wrote this. Um, unlike me, I, I, was, I was actually there, but he's just imagining what it would be like in Tokyo. And so he has uh, all of these uh, anime figures and clowns and cowboys and things like this running, running around, you know, in, in his uh, parodical uh, version of this. And so dozens, by now hundreds of people have made their own modified version of this work. Um, so that's really what's interesting about it. But now, even though it'll be a little bit of a letdown, um, I'll read from what Taroko Gorge on my screen right now happens to be generating line by line. Brows trail the ripplings. Height paces the shape. 
shade, the encompassing sinuous objective cool. Monkeys trail the flows. Basins hold, veins linger. Forest roams the flows. Enter the driven. Mists ex exercise the shape. Stones rest. Stones exercise the flow. Stamp the straight arched clear. Shape paces the stone. Rocks hum. Shapes hold. Brows command the shape. Track the encompassing fine straight arched. So there's much more to say about the particular structure. There are strophes of at least two lines representing walking along pathways, but in between these, there may be one or more lines that represents standing at a viewing spot. And then in between these strophes are these single lines that end in an M dash, they trail off. And those are there because of my experience of walking through the tunnels that Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist Army carved where they bend and you can't see the end of the tunnel. You can't see the light in some cases when you first walk in, you have to walk a ways until you see the end of it. Um, so there's specific sorts of motivation for the shape of this poem, but it generates the text without any limit, generates um, endlessly. Um, and so when people appropriate what I've done, to maintain this form, but make this about something else, make it about um, walking along the beach or cooking and trying to manage responsibilities or George Taikei or um, the conflation of lines from Metallica's albums or um, uh, toys and uh, and waste or all, all of these different um, uh, sorts of things. Um, that particular form is, is one of the things that's carried along. It's not just that uh, there's some handy code. There's a computer program uh, that I wrote that turned out to be useful, um, but it also embodies a particular computational form. And um, so people liked uh, playing with that and uh, goading me and uh, uh, producing uh, a variety of different works, some more uh, serious and some more playful. So. Yeah. And uh, actually, before we close out, just because mm -hmm. I had heard you say it and um, I'm curious, I'll be sure to check out the website to actually take a look at mm -hmm. exactly how it works. Um, just afterwards, but uh, sure. so when you say poetry generator, is there an element of chance as in every time you open up the web page, it may generate a different poem mm -hmm. with words in different locations? Sure. Uh, is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. And then like different sure. um, like word like types of words go in certain positions, but like the overall yes. position of the poem may stay the same or depending yeah. may change as well. Yeah, I think most generally, um, I think of a poetry generator as a computer program that when run you know, outputs uh, some poetic language. Now, often randomness is involved. Randomness certainly can be involved um, or pseudo randomness if you wanna be very strict about it. Um, you can use um, uh, your programming languages random function to pick from a range of possibilities. You can create what I would call distributional texts, right? So it doesn't mean that the author isn't doing anything. The, the author has given up uh, possibilities, 
Um, but for instance, if you were to write, uh, let's say you were to write lines on a deck of cards, 52 cards, right? And shuffle them up and then read the result. Well, you still would have written each of those lines, but yeah. you decided um, to allow the shuffling process to present its own order for those lines. So in a sense, you didn't write the text that resulted, but you wrote the distribution, you defined the distribution from which that text arose. Oh, okay. yeah. So you can do that. That's one of the possibilities that computation affords you. Mm -hmm. But I also have programs that are deterministic. So one of them, round, actually bases each string that it produces on one of the digits of pi and it computes the digits of pi. Now, the digits of pi are not random. The 572nd digit of pi is always the, the same 572nd digit of pi, right? Um, so this is a poem that results, which is boundless, it's, it's infinite, it has no particular limit to it, but it's deterministic you'll get the same thing every time, oh. right? So that's round. And then I have another book length poem, The True List, which is also a deterministic program and the 140 page output of that program that those things together constitute the book. Uh, so randomness can be used um, you can, if you want to, be a distributional writer, but that's not the only way to be a computational writer. You can also write deterministically, and there's a history of this. Um, some of the pieces I was mentioning earlier and Memory Slam, you know, Brian Geisen did the permutation poems, which are not uh, random. Um, they involve exhaustive, uh, they, they don't sample from a distribution, they involve uh, exhaustively showing you the possibilities for permutation of words. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways in which one can engage um, with uh, computation and randomness provides some nice opportunities, but uh, you shouldn't think that's the only thing that yeah. you can do. There's also other possibilities. Yeah, that's really interesting. I actually am myself looking to look more into that. So thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, good talking with you. Uh, stay warm. Take care.